What's up everybody? John Delarose here, the leading Hispanic voice in science fiction. We'll wait for a couple people to show up here on Twitter and all that. Um, I'm gonna try something out new for a sec, see, uh, see what it's like. I get a lot of collected editions of older comic books and things like that. Um, and I, I used to have a feature on my blog where I'd review something um, either a book or a comic book or whatever, um, periodically, I like to not use my, my hands as much as possible unless I'm actually doing writing that matters at this point. That's why my blogs are kind of a little pithier and shorter now, and I'm not doing the reviews on there so much anymore. But I know a lot of people like comics and like old sci-fi stuff and things like that, so I'll review whatever I feel like at the time. We'll see how often I actually end up doing it. Um, you know, it depends on, on, on whether I have time to read or not also. Yeah, hit, hit like and stuff, because, uh, it, uh, it uh, gets the algorithm going uh, so that more people can see it. And uh, and that's important here. So if you don't know who I am, I'm John Delarose. Uh, I write comic books. Uh, I'm, I My Flying Sparks campaign superhero stuff is uh, probably my most famous stuff. And uh, it's about a hero and villain who are dating under their secret identities. It's good like 80s style uh, with real character development. Uh, there's, there's something that happens every issue, a beginning, middle and end, and then the hooks for the next issue. Yeah, I, it reads a lot like that old stuff that you used to love back in, in, in Spider-Man before before things changed. And in, uh, in the, I'd say the Bat books also is, or is, is a good uh, good stuff there. So check that out if you haven't already. All right, Spider-Man. So this was, um, this was uh, the 1991, I believe, 1990 offering uh, from Marvel Comics. Basically, they had um, Amazing Spider-Man going since the 60s, Spectacular Spider-Man going since the 70s, web of Spider-Man going since the 80s, and uh, Todd McFarlane was writing, or, or I'm sorry, drawing comics for Amazing Spider-Man at the time, and he wanted to branch out and do something different. He was about to, to kind of drop um, his duties there on Spider-Man, maybe go to a smaller book or whatever, and the editor said, hey, why don't you just make your own Spider-Man book? And so they launched him a Spider-Man book, uh, which had a cover just like this. Um, let's see if they got the actual cover inside. Uh, they do. So there it is, um, just like that. And um, they, uh, it was very popular. It was one of the best selling comics of all time or something like that when it came out. Of course, there's a brand new number one and everybody falls for that gimmick. Moreover, they, they started doing that variant cover gimmick uh, with this, with, uh, with um, uh, they had you know, a black variant cover, they had a bagged variant cover, this and a gold variant cover. You know, it, it was just, uh, they, they went through the gambit and everybody rushed to go collect these. It was worth so much money. I don't know what they're worth now, if they're worth anything. But I got the collected edition. It was oversized. Um, and I was like, okay, I'll read it again. i go through and read these. Um, Todd McFarlane kind of had a different style where he was doing uh, these like five issue arcs earlier than a lot of other people were. So it's like you didn't have, like I said, you know, what I like about comics is you have that one, that story that kind of builds into other stories, but they're all their own unique stories. He actually straight up had like part one, just opened the story and it went all the way through to part five and it read like a graphic novel. And so uh, he did that in this. Um, there were a few different ones in this. The first one was Torment. And Torment was, uh, a, there's like Calypso, who's like a, a craven acolyte or something like that. And I don't, I don't even remember, but she wasn't really explained very well. And that's what I'll get to in, in Todd McFarlane's writing in a second. Um, and then the, she was uh, mind controlling the lizard to go fight Spider-Man, and that's that's basically the entire story. Um, there there was not much to it. A lot of graphics, a lot of, a lot of a lot of just like pure action moments, which is fine. Um, it, it's just uh, I I don't. It was not very compelling. I'd say it, it was all right. Um, if you like Todd McFarlane's art, you know it's nice to look at. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Todd McFarlane's art. I'm going to be honest, um, and here's why. Um, I, I think it's fine when he does these like he he does a lot of these you know big spread pages, which, which artists love to do now because they're fast to draw. Um, and I think when people are in costume, they look great. But if you look at them in like, um, you know, not in costume right there, you see how Peter's face is just like flat. It's very bizarre. And he's got weird eyebrows and, and weird eyes. And then Mary Jane's got these like half anime eyes that they're not like all the way anime eyes. Um, and then, it, you know, he does this kind of weird proportional thing it just doesn't work out for me uh, when they're not in costume. Um, and of course, like, you know, lots of gritty stuff because it's in the early 90s. Wow, look at the teeth or our, you know, that, that type of thing. Um, and that's what you get out of this. So um, it was all right on that front. Um, the story, now here, here's the deal. 
We learned in the 90s, they did this uh, this experiment when Todd McFarlane, right after this, uh, he did si uh, 15 issues of this before he finally quit and formed Image Comics with, with Eric Larson and Rob Liefeld and a couple others. Um, and they were like, we're this this was the era where where these superstar artists were really starting to be superstars for the first time, and you know th there's names and comics and all that, but this is when Wizard Magazine was dropping, and and you know this was when comics were really at its peak, um, and so these artists became superstars. They they went to conventions, they were treated like rock stars. Everybody thought they were just awesome, and so they're like, hey, we are way better than the companies here. People are following us for the first time in comics. Because uh, the comics are always set up that you buy Spider-Man regardless of who's drawing it, not not you follow the creator to Spider-Man. That's how they set up their industry. For the first time, the creators were really uh, taking front seat. And with that came this sort of rock star mentality. That's why he got to start his own number one book uh, because of that. And uh, after that, he decided that wasn't enough. And he went and founded Image Comics. Now, Image Comics was founded on this premise that these artists were all that you need. These superstar artists are really all that you need for your comics. You don't need writers. You don't need, you know, all, all this other stuff's tertiary. And we learned very quickly in Spider-Man here that that's very much not the case. Um, the, this, this what it, where it suffers big for, for the most part is there's no uh, personal stakes whatsoever for the characters. Uh, Spider-Man's out fighting. Yes, he's getting beat up. Oh my gosh, he's getting beat up real bad. He's getting beat up worse in the next issue, worse in the next issue. He's barely surviving and then somehow he overcomes. Okay, that's not a very compelling story. I mean, you've read that about Spider-Man 50,000 times. You have to have some sort of personal stakes or personal drama in there in order to make it happen. And he, he sort of does this with like Mary Jane getting annoyed with him going out and being Spider-Man and then he shows her out. They, this was a very bizarre moment for him. Mary Jane went out clubbing and starts going out into like like nightclubs in New York and like twelve one in the morning, dancing with random dudes while Peter's out being Spider Man. It's like I wouldn't let my wife do that. I don't know. Uh, very very. Uh, and, and I know Mary Jane was kind of like a firebrand, uh, you know, to start as a character. But that that just like that that was very odd uh, to read. It was like it's like she's actually uh, trying to like punish Peter or something like that uh, by by like being around other dudes or something like that. I don't understand. Um, but there was there was nothing personal to it beyond that. I mean, there were there were a few scenes. It was not very interesting. They did not um, they did not push very far, and so uh, there there wasn't much there. The next um, that was a, the first five issues. The next uh, one is it was uh, they had the the hobgoblin guest star, but the hobgoblins changed in this one. And I remember reading this one as a kid, um, and. Uh, the Hobgoblin was a big uh, deal from the the Amazing Spider-Man comics. They did, they did a huge deal a few years uh, before this in the 80s. That one had personal stakes, and, and it was very interesting. They built a big mystery out of it. Roger Stern wrote it. Roger Stern's one of the greatest uh, Spider-Man writers out there. And again, he comes in here, and uh, the Hobgoblin's weird and, like, disfiguring children and stuff like that. Super dark and gritty. But, but again, there's like, there's no reason to care about, like, Peter is not, like, he just kind of inserts himself into it, just starts beating the guy up, and the kid doesn't like it. He actually sides with Hobgoblin, um, and Ghost Rider shows up for a bit, and this, they do a little Marvel team up with this, it seems to some degree, uh, with this series. But again, there's just like, you know, there's a fight, a big long fight, big long fight, big long fight, big long fight, it ends, no, no characters develop, nothing changes. Um, and so that, that is like really the hallmark of this series. There's just like these arcs with pretty Todd McFarlane art when they're in costume, uh, when they're out of costume, they look awkward. Um, and then there's just no reason to care about the stories. The next one is perceptions. Now this is actually the, probably the best, um, storyline in here. Uh, Wolverine's the guest star in this one and they go to Canada. Peter sent there on assignment for the bugle. And, uh, there's like this, like, Sasquatch out there killing people or so they think there's a big twist and it's like not really a twist because they, they telegraph it the whole way through um, and it's really some dudes out there who are like and, and it like they go too far to like make the dudes bad at the end they're like you're a sick effer you're a pedophile you know like I mean they, they really like want to make sure you know that's the bad guy and the, they're doing the right thing by saving the Sasquatch but it's really um, you know it, it's still at least there was some twist to it compared to the others so perceptions worked out. This is another example of what I'm talking about when he's out of costume. Like, just look at how strange his face looks um, and all the weird details on his hands. Like, I, I just, it looks like he's like an 80-year-old man 
you know, who has Botox or something like that. Very bizarre. Um, I, I, I don't think he, his art works very well when he's out of costume whatsoever. But that was still more interesting than the other ones. Again, there's just no personal stakes for Peter. Uh, nothing's happening with Peter. Peter's not developing. He doesn't have a cast of side characters really doing anything with him. Uh, I mean, you interact with a couple Bugle people, but not really. Um, it's just like, it's it's like they just like went full tilt for pinups and nothing else. Uh, and, that, and that's the whole point of this. Um, after that, we got a couple more stories left. Um, we had, we, they rehashed the... Uh, the first cover, I thought this was really cute, the 13th collectible issue. Um, and they put him in the black costume. Um, they have this like argument that Spider-Man needs to go underground into the sewers and he wants to be like dark so that nobody can see him. And that's why he goes into the black costume. Seems like a very thin reason to get the black costume in there. Just the writing's very, very poor and like very ham-fisted when, when they actually are trying to do something. It's like, it's like he wants to draw, like this one has Morbus in it. It's like he wants to draw the like cool Spider-Man Morbus fight. And so the plot is just a device to force that fight to happen so that he has an excuse to, to draw the fight. And that's, that's what it feels like in all of this. This is the, this is the problem with the Image Comics model of the early 90s where these, where it was just these rock star artists who just like, we don't need no stinking writers. It shows, it shows every time. And when people try to recreate that sort of thing, uh, every single time, every single time I've seen it done, uh, it always has the same problems is that there's just a very little character element to it. Uh, there's very little uh, to root for, very little to, reason to care. Uh, it's just, it's just a bunch of, uh, bunch of, a uh, bunch of pinups for the most part. Um, so that was it. Um, there's one more storyline in here, uh, which is a two part storyline. It crosses over. Um, he skipped issue number 15, went to number 16. It crosses over with X-Force with Rob Liefeld. And he did the entire issue, uh, sideways. So all of the art is sideways. This is one of the best drawings in the book right here. Big juggernaut thing. Like, like I said, it's just an excuse to draw the superheroes and pinups, uh, more than it is, uh, to actually have a storyline, but it's pretty cool that he experimented with doing the whole sideways thing. Here's, here's cable, like the same way. It's another pinup, right? Two pages. And, um, you know, it's just a big knockdown drag out fight. Spider-Man just kind of swings by there and it doesn't really matter why he's there. Uh, they're fighting the Juggernaut. Spider-Man's like, you know, they're referencing the uh, Roger Stern story again where he fought the Juggernaut. A lot of Roger Stern references in this, if you think about it, with the Hobgoblin and this. It's like, it's like they knew that that writing was, was, was really choice and they wanted, to, they wanted to give the audience the member berries, but like they just could not recapture that because they didn't have a real writer on it. Um, and that's, that's what we get. There's really nothing special or interesting about this. Um, the Juggernaut kind of loses and then they kind of go away. And Spider-Man really was not much of a part of that for whatever reason. So that was it. So that's it. Um, so Todd McFarlane drew this, um, this whole book, except for the last issue where Rob Liefeld drew the cross crossover. And then he pieced out to start Image Comics. And um, then he went to Spawn. And I think Spawn, as I recall, suffers from a lot of the same issues that this does originally. He was trying to do a gritty, dark Batman sort of character and uh, just wanted to show those gritty, dark fights. And uh, they, they tried to do it with Spider-Man. It really doesn't work uh, flavor-wise with Spider-Man whatsoever. Spider-Man's a very lighthearted character. So when you, when you go there with uh, Spider-Man, it just really feels bad. Um, but on, on the other front, like, you're just not getting much story from it. And that is a lesson to people that you cannot just rely on art. Um, it's, it's in fact the other way around. You can get away with art that is mediocre or art that is like not that detailed as long as the story and the characters are compelling. Um, and I've seen it time and time again. You can, you can have Alex Ross drawing a book and if it's just a bunch of pinups, it's just a bunch of pinups. It's not, it's not gonna carry anything unless there's a beautiful story behind it and beautiful character development behind it. So uh, this sucked um, at, the, at the end of the day, but because uh, of the way it was written as just a bunch of big knockdown drag out fights without much to it, you could just skim through it real quick, uh, see the pretty drawings you wanna see. So I guess it's not that bad, could be worse. Uh, and that's, that's my review of this. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna read next week, so we'll see uh, what, what we got. Uh, if you like my reviews and you like my analysis, you'll probably like my comic books because I try to implement the things that I like uh, in mine and, the, and to not implement the things I don't like in mine. Um, and so check out Flying Sparks. Flying Sparks Volume 2 is uh, on pre-order now. Volume 1's up on Amazon. Um, and that's gonna be my superhero universe. I'm really building a huge complex story with it. 
uh, maybe, maybe a little too grandiose for what I'm doing, but it, it's a lot. It's a lot of fun, and uh, and people have told me that the second volume is just fantastic. Who have read it so far, so I hope you will check it out and enjoy it. Um, that's all for today. I'll upload this to YouTube a little bit later, and uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next time I decide to do one of these. Peace.